And now we are leaping south in Egypt all the way down to Luxor, which is one of the most important cities to visit when you're in Egypt. It was the site of the capital of Egypt for a long period during the Pharaonic times. And there are amazing temple ruins there today and other sites that we'll be exploring with our local Egyptologist guide, Vivian. Starting out at Luxor Temple. This is the beautiful facade that was built by Ramses II. You know that Ramses II is a man with a very big ego and he wanted to leave his traces everywhere. After Ramses II constructed that entry, then the temple got a very big meaning and a very beautiful facade like you can see. There used to be right here six statues and only three are left. There used to be right here two obelisks. One is standing still in Cedar right here and the other one is in La Place de la Concorde in Paris. What is the obelisk actually? It's a one big monolith stone, rectangular in shape from the bottom, and the peak of it is having a ben ben, that pyramidian shape that is always covered with two metals, again 80% gold and 20% silver, so that whenever the sun would be shining on it, then the sun rays would be reflected again to the valley, then the people who live in the valley would remember the dead king. They would say, aha, uh -huh, this is the obelisk of King so-and-so, and he has done this and that in his life, and in that way the king stays alive in the memory of the people. And then on the obelisk, we always see a biography about the deceased pharaoh. Let's go inside and see what is happening inside the temple. Back there are three shrines dedicated to the father god Amun-Re, and this is the one in the center. Now, right behind the pylon, like we could see, there is an open court. Look, right behind the pylon, right here, we're going to find a mosque. So, back in the 14th century, this was the level of the city. Where you see the bricks, this was the level of the city. They've decided to build on this neglected part of the country. Now, when they have excavated this temple back in the 19th century, they thought, well, we cannot destroy a mosque in an Islamic country. So we'll leave the mosque to be a monument itself. And what we're going to do is, we're going just to say that this was the level of the city. And we're going to change the entry of the mosque instead of that the people used to come over here on the mud and on the bricks to go inside the mosque and use that door up there as an entry. They changed the entry to be at the other side, on the main road, okay? And they left the mosque in situ. Nowadays, they're making restorations for the mosque and they're fixing it from inside and afterwards, after it will become in a good state of preservation, they'll keep using it. Right here is a court where we find always statues of Ramses. And we can read his cartouches everywhere. You see, Ramses could not keep up making all the statues he needed to do. But what he has made was that he took statues of the ancestors, simply erased their names, and he has reused the statue. He had written his own name in a cartouche on the statue to identify that this is his own. It means that they were taken from other ancestors and reused during the time of Ramses. Right here, we'll find statues of Ramses. Again, made out of diorite. Diorite is a stone that is harder than granite. And King Ramses is represented with the royal signs. What are the royal signs of a king? First of all, he wears the double crown of Upper and Lower Egypt. And then, he wears a headdress. And he wears a false royal beard. What is the meaning of this beard? When you get older, then you get wiser. Then you have more experience in life, then you know better than anybody else. And although he was represented with young facial features, but yet he wanted to show that he's got the wisdom, the cleverness, the knowledge, the experience of the elder people. And he shows that with his false royal beard. Look at the muscles and veins and the body structure that is ideal. Ramses was quite a sportive man, okay? He lived also until he was about to reach 90 years old, and that's in a 
an exception in the ancient period. So life expectations at that time was only 40 or 45 years. Always we find the women, the children represented very small beside his legs. The amazing part about these statues right here that I like very much is that diorite is a very hard stone. It's even harder than granite. So all these other stones are granite statues. Look at this. This is your right, which is harder than granite. Now to make details like the details you're seeing here of the belly, of the muscles and veins, and the fingers and the fingernails and the toes. You know, to make a statue today out of that stone, we have to use laser cutters, and souls ending with diamond ends. Meshi Meshi, come. I'll show you a very nice detail on the throne of Egypt. So that man with a female breast, that's another representation of the Nile God of the south and of the north. He's tying the two flowers to the lung. The Sima Tawi symbol. Sima means unification, Tawi is the two lands. Now what do we see under the Sima Tawi symbol? We see here all the enemies of Egypt represented at the bottom. Their arms are tied behind their backs. And their necks are tied with a long rope. Joining between all of them. We'll leave that part and go to another section. All this section was built during the time of Tutankhamun. And then it was restored during the time of Ramses II. What Ramses has done is that he had erased the name of King Tut and he has written his own name instead. We know that about Ramses already. Why would Amenophis III build a temple here? Because right here there were just simply shrines and little chapels dedicated to various gods and goddesses. The main chapel was belonging to the goddess Mut. Now, Amenophis III was not a son of a royal wife. And then when he got married, he got married to a woman of the common people. So actually he had no right to ascend the throne of Egypt. What he has done is that he has promised the priests, if you help me and support me and make me, make me king of Egypt, so then I am going to build for you a festival court and a temple where you can offer the offerings in the Opet feast and the place will grow up and you'll get more donations. So in you, how the game is played. And the priests always make a legend for every ruler who did not have the right to rule the country. They say he was a son of a god. He's a divine. So then, he deserved to ascend the throne of Egypt. After he ascended the throne of Egypt, he built a festival court. And this is what that will be offered in the upper feast. We're going to find that in this section of the temple, they have decided to build a church. Going to the temple to pray to the god so-and-so, to the goddess Smoot or to the god amun Re. And then they realized that the temple is no longer a temple to worship Amun Re, it's now a church. In the time in which the temple was changed to be a church, which was in the third century, they've decided to put a layer of stucco on the walls and decided to paint on it. Last Supper, right here, the old gods, and then those two columns were taken from temples, they were recarved, and they've put and added Ionic and Corinthian capitals like we see right here. It's amazing to find in one place an ancient Egyptian temple, and a church, and a mosque as well. We'll leave that part now and we'll go directly to the sanctuary that was used during the time of Alexander the Great. See, Alexander the Great was a Macedonian man. He was a high general, yes. He was a strong leader, yes, but yet he was from Macedonia. And the Greek people looked at the Macedonians to be a lower class of people. So he heard about the position of a divine to any king who did not have the right to rule the country. And in that way, the king would get the legitimate right to ascend the throne of Egypt and to become a pharaoh. And in that way, Alexander proved to his people that he's not just a regular Macedonian general, but he is a son of a divine. When he came here to Luxor, he decided to build a shrine and it was used later on to be a sanctuary for the king of the gods, Amun Re. He has even represented himself dressed as an Egyptian pharaoh, and he's always standing, offering and worshiping 
the king of the gods, Zanonrei, and his son, Honsu, will leave that section and proceed straight forward. We are now in the most holy part of the temple, which is the sanctuary of sanctuaries. This is the ancient Egyptian sanctuary. This was the original place of power inside the temple. Nobody was allowed to come in here unless he was the highest priest or the king himself. Visiting this Luxor temple in the late afternoon and early evening was ideal because we get this interesting change of lighting and it's still very busy at night with the beautiful spotlights on the structure. So we had it both ways with beautiful daylight and this evening illumination at Luxor Temple in Egypt. The next morning after breakfast on our comfortable Nile cruise ship, we head out for another day's activities. This time we're going to visit the even larger ancient temple at Karnak. How are you today? Very good. Today. Very good today. Slept? Relaxed? 